Good evening and thank you all for coming here. It's an honor and privilege to be called to deliver this address to all of you. It is such an august gathering, I'm hugely tensed. <laughs> anyway, well, the issue is, uh, it's a very sensitive, contentious issue these days to track who are the Indians. The main problem is probably in any other country this particular thing will only be discussed among the scientists and probably the practitioners. Other than that nobody will even bother where from really we came say 200,000 or 300,000 years ago. But it's not so here because I'd like to describe what can be the issues and we'd like to present one structure through which by going through a huge problem we'll try to show that there is a structure, there is a pattern that we can still find out. Now the problem is, the problem is so huge that no single field of study can really track it completely. It requires a multidisciplinary approach and an inter interdisciplinary approach to sort it out. And I begin here with an apologetic self-defense by quoting the second coming of W.B.S. 1920. Turning and turning in the widening zaya, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Probably here lies the problem. The best are full of confusion and the worst are absolutely sure about everything. We'll try to question this attitude. We'll try to show that things are much more delicate and not at all crass as people think it to be. We'll make an attempt to show that the claim of conviction by the overt nationalist history that calls some Indian people invaders and some son of the soil, the battle is far from over. And it is tantamount to pointless passionate intensity that we began with. It is not corroborated by scientific evidence. On the contrary, we have to mix up things, the linguistic, archaeological, climatological and genetic studies present a combined picture that may not be fully self-consistent yet because it's such a huge, huge problem. But still, it gives a collective pattern of human migrations that is fairly harmonious. We can come to some idea. When we come to the end of this discourse, we probably believe that we are all migrants and kin. However, I do not present this narrative as an original researcher. I rather present it as a science museum curator who is a custodian of scientific information who can weigh between the logic of different propositions and then present this story in a language which is closer to most of us devoid of the scientific parlance of all these fields involved. At the outset however I need to mention a few references so I do. I would like to assert that we constructed this proposition based upon original works of the experts like Mallory in archaeology, David Anthony in archaeology, Asko Papola in linguistics, then Shirin Ratnagar, historian, J.M. Kenner, anthropologist and historian, and uh, Tony Joseph, who is a journalist but who has done a phenomenal work in tracking the whole research in this film and presenting a review book that is fantastic. 
I'll also draw frequently from the articles and papers of Dr. Bashant Sinde, Deccan College, Dr. Shamashi Shengupta of Paris University and Dr. Pathapratim Majumdar of ISI and National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, who have all worked into this field. And I may not quote the exact inline references from now on for brevity, but from this list you can figure out one thing, that the work is still on, it's a work in progress. And there is a difference in scientific approach and the approaches of other fields. The other fields, they are since always sure. They claim that you cannot change your goalpost, your position must not change. You have to be at one place only. On the contrary, science is never sure with itself. Uh, Galileo proved that Ptolemy was wrong, Newton proved that Galileo was wrong, and then Einstein proved that probably Newton is not correct, and that doesn't demean any one of them. In science we always go to a better truth, probably another layer of truth, and that doesn't have to demean the person who was the earlier person. So similarly here our position will probably change from time to time with new evidences, as it was considered earlier, it is no longer so. It has shifted quite a bit. It will further shift perhaps with the advent of new evidences and new proofs and with usage of new tools. And as archaeological findings say that we have found the oldest homo sapien remains on the record in, an, in a very improbable place, Morocco. The very recent finding is that in Morocco we have found Homo sapiens samples which are dated back to 300,000 years back. Now so far our idea was that human beings were mostly found in the East Africa. Here we show the place. Mostly this was the known region, but as of now we know that here we got even older a sample. Now what does it mean? Does it mean that all of a sudden human beings was, were generated there in that place? Probably it is not true. And the finding doesn't say so. There we have got eight different individual skull samples, probably from different persons. And that shows that earlier we had an idea that in East Africa in some particular garden of Eden the Homo sapiens developed in a rather quick span and then it spread over the world. But now the new idea says probably it is not true. Probably the garden of Eden is Africa itself. So it's a big garden. And in this big garden, the fun is perhaps the evolution occurred a little more early and the late, latest position uh, according to a paper that was published in 7th June 2017, it shows that uh, almost 300,000 years back Homo sapiens was generated and that started spreading all over Africa. So the out of Africa that we attempt and that we speak about that may be even even earlier. More recently researchers have suggested that Jabal Arud, Jabal Arud the place is in Morocco humans were an archaic species that survived in North Africa. It was also said that they are not exactly homo sapiens, they are archaic species but later on it was confirmed that that is not the case. They were homo sapiens though there was some differences. They had a longer brain size, they had a little different nose pattern but even then that was considered and identified finally as homo sapiens. And uh, when Respected Dr. Arvindan speaks about the molecular biologic stance and uh, other evidences, uh, genetical evidences. Probably he will get into further detail. Now a caveat is in order here. When we will get into these details of uh, the migration, we will probably talk about, I also have to get to some sort of genetic uh, references. 
and we will particularly talk about two forms of genome in human beings one is called the mitochondrial dna in our cells there are two places where the dna are found one is in the nucleus and one is in the mitochondria now the mitochondrial dna has a very specific character that it entirely comes from the mother and that is why if the mitochondrial dna is analyzed the maternal hierarchy of a person can be completely determined on the other side we also know that a male person is normally a carrier of a x and y chromosome where the y chromosome comes from the father and a female person will carry x and x so she does not have any y chromosome so the paternal hierarchy among the males are determined by the y chromosome and the maternal hierarchy in all persons are determined by mitochondrial dna so studying the mitochondrial dna we can definitely determine the maternal ancestry and the paternal ancestry for the male can rather be well decided by the study of y chromosome and by studying all these we have decided that even though 300000 years ago this homo sapiens samples were available over there but now we know that they came out they came out of africa about 70000 years ago but the point is why do we put the time of the exodus to 70000 years ago 300000 years ago when the species was generated why do we fix a time 70000 years more or less we of course keep a range and say that that is the time when the species came out of it there's a reason for it when you look at the mitochondrial dna of people outside the africa all around the world you'll find out that they all descended from a single haplogroup now what is this haplogroup that probably sir will explain much better but even then i give you a very small hint because i will need it in my discussion further when you when you can track one particular ancestry throughout its generations you will find out there are places at which new mutations occur in the genome and from there if that mutation is copied in further generations we say that one branch is generating another sub branch and one branch is called a haplogroup it is identified by some characteristic markers it's a very gross definition professionals will not speak this language they will probably even not endorse this definition this way but we can identify them as groups with special characteristics in uh, their genome and if we do so we'll find out that uh, outside africa all around the world people have descended from a single haplogroup what does it mean with deep lineage in africa and that haplogroup has a name it's called l3 now think about what this means all people outside of africa are descended from a single african woman who originated the l3 mitochondrial dna we are not only born of a single group we are probably all born of a single mother even the group that came out of africa was not a very large group there are genetic evidences to prove that it was not more than 100 people and among them there might be a few more women perhaps but for none of them the genetic characteristics are carried among all the people of the world all of them outside africa carry the genetic characteristics typical to a particular woman so that shows we are probably born of a single mother africa has about 15 other such haplogroups similar similarly dated haplogroups uh, some are much older and the lineages they have names like l0 l1 l1a and l1c but none of them were part of the group that went out to populate the rest of the world l3 has two immediate descendant lineages therefore two more groups have come out outside africa 
and these two groups they are named as n and n with n having its own major subgroup subhaplo group r thus all of the human population in the world outside africa carries lineages that follow from m n or r there's no other exception while south asia has all three of these haplogroups the europeans only have n and r with m missing so that shows the first exodus out of africa did not immediately populate europe rather it went back later on let us get into those details further the picture is much the same when you look at it 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 is it is a statement that is made out of the study of the mitochondrial dna but if you study the y chromosome lineage as well the picture is more or less the same there are only three haplogroups from africa that went on to populate the rest of the world c d and f so there were more number of male than female of course all deriving from a parent haplogroup called ct now this ct was generated in africa itself so from ct there were three different groups which went out this means that all humans outside of africa are descended from a single man who started the y chromosome haplogroup ct and he was in africa as well what this fact show is that only a subsection of the modern human population in africa moved out to populate the rest of the world and secondly the fact that all the migrating mitochondrial haplogroups descended from l3 and not any other haplogroups suggests that this migration event was a single event and not multiple because multiple migration events would probably have resulted in present day populations deriving their ancestry from a larger number of mitochondrial haplogroups if more people had come then probably more variety would have come out a single haplogroup coming out is a very remarkable phenomenon which shows that there was a single exodus how do you then arrive at the dating of 70000 years ago that is also straightforward by using the mutation rates the scientists geneticists they can study statistically the changes and mutations that occur in our cells and genome in particular and when they do so they can calculate some kind of workable rates now this is not a perfect science this is statistical this is conjectural to a large extent but it is quite good in producing experimental results which tally the theory so that is why it is accepted still now though it is not absolutely solid as scientific as the other principles are so according to that they can detect how many mutations will occur in how many days and depending upon that they have decided that uh, it would be around that period why so let us see in a little more detail they have concluded that l3 emerged approximately 7000 70000 years ago similarly the m lineage is dated 61000 years ago and m to 48000 years ago so the out of africa event could not have been much later than 61000 years ago and it could not have been much earlier than 70000 years ago because otherwise there would have been no l3 lineage in africa at all which is not the case either but this is not an exact science i told you it is fairly good estimate which works if you are trying to identify the time for a major migration it would be also advisable to check the climatic data because all over the world it is normally seen that when the world is more dry cool and a little warm the migrations happen when it is very very cold it is extremely difficult with primitive technology and not much mastery over controlled fire and not much mastery over the clothing to migrate for a long distance that's a very very difficult proposition so mostly migrations happen in windows in windows and phases when there is an glacial period when the 
world is rather favorable then it happens so we say that climatic data should be matched with it even though some migrations indeed have happened uh, in arid and cold climates sometimes that also happens because arid and cold climates help in another way at that time the sea levels get higher i mean the sea levels are higher i'm sorry not higher the sea, sea levels get lower because there is a solidification ice formation and that's why the sea width gets lesser and lesser so it becomes easier to cross over we will let's show an example if we look at this map we will find out that there are certain potential places if we have to go out of africa to the other part of the world then there is one touch point here close to morocco maybe some group was trying that there is another closest proximity from here even though they have to cross this water body but two more prominent points are here and one more prominent point is here even though it is showing as almost a touch here it is not really so there is a 30 km distance here and there are archaeological proofs so we have studied the archaeological samples from here and from this parts whatever is being available and that archaeology shows that these northern routes were never used northern routes were never tried probably it was too difficult for some other reason maybe that's conjectural but definitely this part was used and definitely this route was used because here the archaeological samples that are collected that are very closely matching the period so we know that the exodus probably happened from this is the jabalero samples that we got and here we can see that the brain widths are a little more than the modern one a little different but still it is considered homo sapiens and uh, these are the distributions this is the uh, y chromosome and this is mitochondrial dna mitochondrial dna is actually a circular dna and this shows the distribution of the haplogroups all over the world so all these collectively show that it was an exodus and exactly at that period out of africa now out of the four possible routes that we discussed here we show the routes these two routes were used mostly because immediately after the 7000 uh, years ago the time period we are getting samples here in those regions the europe was populated much later i said and we have reasons to believe that why why did it happen rather the exodus started from here and we find out even though here the path is not complete there are in india two paths probably one sub himalayan path from here and then that route went there and the other part came here and through sri lanka it went to this region and ultimately it reached australia but there are certain specialities in this whole route that i would like to discuss in a little more detail four possible routes have been suggested for the ancient modern human beings out of africa matching archaeological evidence of fossil remains climatological cycles and genetics scientists conclude that the northern routes were never used but the two southern routes were the ones adopted for this migration the climate and the resistance due to the presence of neanderthals that is a very important point that when the out of africa group came out of africa and if they at all tried to get into the european zone the europe at that time was full of neanderthals they were the main species of hominins there at that time and neanderthals were quite powerful so probably it didn't happen immediately that they could master or capture and now we believe that it's more than mastering or capturing or that fighting of which was earlier theory which said that we killed all neanderthals probably that didn't happen uh, because it was seen that in 
Europe, many, most of the people, they have strong presence of Neanderthal genome in the genes in their genome as well. So that shows it was more of a mixture and assimilation than confrontation. Similar thing happened in our case also, we'll come to that. I'll give you a bit, little idea of what can be the possible case here. Now, unlike the northern route, which does not involve any crossing of the sea, the southern route here, which I said that it involves a 30 kilometers sp uh, space here, that probably required them to cross the uh, water body. And we do not know whether they used the boat or not, not because boats do not leave any archaeological record of that period, we are not sure. But it must all happen, after the coming out, they stayed quite long beside the sea and they had developed a beachcombing lifestyle. They were very much familiar with the sea and the water bodies and at that time, uh, if we consider it to be 70,000 and this 70,000 is dependent upon another factor that I will come to immediately. Uh, it is also to be assumed that they came out when the glacial period was starting. And at that time probably that 30 kilometer got shortened and it came to one third of that. So only 10 kilometers probably they had to cross. And that is why it was not that difficult and this was the most used route for the exodus, most likely route for the exodus. Now here it shows if you consider the complete route that now is charted out depending upon different subjects. Here probably you, you are not being able to see it completely. Here is Alaska and from Alaska this route shows up to the tip of Argentina here. Now this is a path, this is a path of the migration in US. Now this was the last part of the migration and here we know that this happened probably around 14,000 years back and when they started from this point they walked down probably to this point taking the complete coastal route it took we know more or less about a couple of thousand years 2000 years it took and on the contrary if we consider the out of Africa route and we consider this route up to Australia it is almost the same Very, very little direct archaeological samples in India are not available, but the bodies are available in Sri Lanka and the bodies are available in Australia. And that shows that in Australia, probably within 5,000 years of the period they came out of Australia, uh, Africa, they reached Australia. The question is, if that has to happen, and if this path is to be tracked completely, then they were in a hurry. They didn't stop in India, they didn't stay in India. At least one dynamic group must have continuously proceeded towards Australia. Is there a genetic proof for it? In fact, the proof is an emphatic yes. It is because when we study the genetic groups, we find out that if more time is spent on a particular place, then more genetic variety is created in that area. But when initially they went through and went up to Australia, there was almost the genetic variety kept intact, not, not much variety generated during this period. So probably when the first group walked down, they did not stop in India or they did not stop in Indonesia. They went very fast. But at the same time, India was largely populated. So one group stayed and one group carried away. That might be the most plausible uh, scenario. But in India, we had a staged dispersal. And as of now, when people tell us stories that India and China 
are the biggest populations there were population booms here and this happened and that happened and that happened particularly for that community and this happened for that community please challenge them we have been historically highest population zones from the very beginning itself it's not that we had a population explosion it is just that that we had the most fertile land the most easy place to live on so the first group came here stayed here they had the highest time to spread all over this land and even in the ancient world we had this distinction of being the highest population zone in this south asia there's nothing peculiar it's quite a normal a natural thing that happen now here is a scenario that we can put together based on what we know around 65000 years ago modern humans arrived in india walking from that particular route and what did they see did they have a open field did they have a place where they can master whatever they like is it open and inviting there's nothing at all hardly possible not that and we know it was not what we know we know what the first is a huge high pop population density of other hominins because it is homo sapiens that came up there but that place was already inhabited by other groups of hominins the homo heidelbergensis uh, Denisovans, uh, the we are not very sure about many of them, and particularly Denisovans uh, is a very risky affair because we have not even given us species name for that particular group. But even then, we know there were variations, and we know that our genes also involve their genes, which means once again it is not a total story of subjugation. There is some story of assimilation as well there too. So. it happened they found a huge population of the ancient hominins they immediately did not go extinct though later on they did and what was the method how did it happen how do you know that you know that because we don't have any fossils fossil records in india i told you and india is not very well excavated so you cannot claim that everything we know probably will know sometimes later but as of now we have huge collection of tools the stone tools that the people used and studying the stone to stone tools the archaeological experts they could ascertain that there are paleolithic tools there are neolithic tools and there are microlithic tools now microliths are very special they say that paleolithic and neolithic tools by their nature can be identified which could have been used by other hominins also and we have a fantastic collection of paleolithic and microlithic tools that shows that there were many other hominins in vimbatka in son valley and all these places these people were there and initially when homo sapiens came they did not want to mingle with them or to confront with them naturally our first attempt is to avoid them and that is why they took the sub himalayan path and they took the coastal path and in that coastal path and sub himalayan path we have collected huge number of microlithic tools and microlithic tools are in one to one correspondence with the homo sapiens so we say that the homo sapiens population extended to that route only whereas initially which was a good area for the early hominins they later on slowly dispersed so what happened afterwards and these are the first group of indians to reach india so now we know that the very start is from migration only there's no son of this soil living still now and we have other proofs and we have other evidences and we have other events coming up in other episodes as well in fact between half and two thirds of our genome wide ancestry today comes from these first indians that we have tested from the current genomic sequences we know it 
This genome-wide figure, which applies to both men and women, is the most appropriate measure to grasp the genetic makeup of Indians. But there are other ways to look into it, which provide other kinds of insights, and that is interesting. For example, if you look at mitochondrial DNA lineage, you will find that somewhere between 70 to 90 percent of people are descendant of the first Indians. So the women of the country, they are mostly having a strong lineage of the first Indians who came out of Africa and stayed back here. The M lineages, the M lineages being the most popular. If you look at the Y chromosome lineages though, the picture is different. First Indian descendants account for only 10 to 40 percent of the haplogroups depending on which population group you are considering. This massive difference between the male and female lines of descendant encapsulates the history of other migrations, the history of latter migrations. So when we say that somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of mitochondrial DNA lineages uh, derive their origin from the first Indians, it means that in the case of 70 to 90 percent of Indian women, if we trust their maternal line back through the ages, you will arrive at a woman who was an original out of Africa migrant and reached India some 65,000 years ago. Similarly, when we say that 10 to 40 percent of Y chromosome lineages are of first Indian descent, it means that in case of 10 to 40 percent of all Indian men, if you test their paternal line back through the ages, you, are, you will arrive at a man who was an original out of Africa migrant. But what happened for the others? The question lies there. And why is it so different for the women and men? The main reason is if there are further subsequent migrations, it is very likely the first migration was rather innocuous. There was no other effects to be visible. But now when further waves of homo sapiens will come in here, firstly, those who are migrating probably will always have greater percentage of male because of the physical requirement and lesser percentage of female. And when they are coming, we will study it from other factors immediately. I'm just giving you a hint of it. The next migrations probably will happen for farming, it will happen for search of metallurgy, it will happen for the lookout of some resources, and it will be probable if this migration is successful, then the people coming in, if they have something more to claim, they will have a better success of having or finding out a local female mate than the local man who will by that time be subjugated by this coming group from the outside. So the migration will give them an age and that is why the male representation of the migration will be much higher than in the female migration and if there is any back propagation from this country to the other countries where the female will also be traveling then only will have a better representation of that group outside which is not the case so far so far the data is proving now the question is who are these latter migrants and when did they arrive to answer this, we need to turn to paleoclimate or the climatic changes of the ancient times. As we saw earlier, the earliest evidence for microlith in the subcontinent dates to around 45,000 years ago. And by 35,000 years ago or so, they had become widespread all over India. That means from 65,000 years to 35,000 years ago, the first Indian has been well spread all over the Indian subcontinent. The climate had already started deteriorating as the world began its descent towards a long glacial period that would last from around 29,000 years ago to 40, 14,000 years ago. But the ending of the glacial age was not quite neat and dramatic. 
the gradual warming that began near the end of the glacial age was interrupted by another cold twitch that lasted about 1300 years between 12900 and 11700 years ago when the world climate turned dry and arid once more it is only when this period ended ended the world really entered into a long lasting warm period called holocene which we are still in uh and here here we are coming to an age which will dawn in the agriculture and tony joseph i am tempted to quote him he is very eloquent here in describing it is often during periods of climatic upheaval such as these that we see new dramatic developments taking place in human history proving once again that our species needs either lack of resources or promise of plenty to propel it forward thus in the early holocene we see on and off experiments in the fertile crescent in west asia today's iraq iran and levant south asia egypt and later china these experiments would ultimately lead to humankind taking to agriculture almost everywhere not all these experiments were successful now agriculture started in several zones these are much later period here agriculture started much later but the first agriculture that started here in mesopotamia in nine valley here in india doctors india and of course start and we have to look for several signs and symbols archaeologically if you have one sickle if you have some tools which are harvesting tools you cannot immediately conclude that the cultivation has set in because even the hunter gatherer will use the cultivation tools but they will not cultivate really cultivation means domestication of the plant domestication of the animal and domestication of the plant and the animal will generate certain characteristic evolutions in the plants and in animals which will not be seen if the corresponding community is only harvesting hunting and gathering but not really cultivating what is that number 1 is it is seen that the that the animals they will be more tame the more aggressive animals will not be selected natural because the human being who will try to hurt the group they will it's all like our political leaders they want a mob with less intelligence and less aggressive nature and that is what we also want when we tame the cow herds or any other herds we want the less intelligent we want the less powerful we want the more tame which will give more milk and probably we want more power but not the aggressive nature so it will be a tamed power and that happens and by that selection of the human being the species itself changes because one with those characters will have a higher chance to live will have higher chance to replicate their characteristics in further generations same thing happens with the seeds when the seeds are also domesticated human beings are doing the job of further replication so the natural strength of the seeds are not required anymore and that is why when archaeologists study any particular community for uh, confirmation of onset of agriculture it is seen that those particular characteristics are important now what we find in india is that that the, the archaeologists say that here in northwest india it was probably domesticated but not fully cultivated at that period of time which occurred later on but in mesopotamia it was cultivated the uh, animals were domesticated the plants were cultivated and those selection effects were appearing and in india it happened 
in an uh, i'm not saying it was in india actually the first opera there there is a matter here is matter the matter is close to current balochistan and in balochistan around 7000 bc we find the first sign of cultivating barley now this barley amer kind of things now uh, even though it is contemporary that inside the gangetic plains we had a rice cultivation facility at that period of time but that could not compete with this one probably the archaeologists guess that the rice cultivation was never fully converted to cultivation it ended as a harvesting only and that is why the first experiment like many other cultivating and agricultural experiments performed in many part of the world in mehergarh it was successful but in the gangetic plain it was not so we had to wait a few millennium more to come back to the gangetic civilization that generated cultivation altogether now the hot spot of the earliest experiments in agriculture in south asia is a village today called mehergarh located at the foot of bulan pass in balochistan in modern day pakistan the site was inhabited for a period of over 44000 4400 years between roughly 7000 bc and 2600 bc now mehergarh if you look at it you will understand that it is at the outskirts of the harappan civilization and we call something civilization with certain characteristics when they are manifest normally when settlements occur the settlements go on for production production of production of agricultural products and when agricultural products become easier that gives much more time to the people and when that happens immediately people takes to other sort of uh, occupations in mehergarh it is seen that when cultivation becomes easier at the same time the uh, female bodies are found there with very elaborate decorations and elaborate ornamentations all through their body they use shells they use uh, different sort of bangles and all those things started coming and watching them you can understand that it is becoming a profession now it is not only the agriculture as a profession that is being adopted by the people people are getting their recess times and they are diverging into other sort of creative activities generating other sorts of activities and what sort of diversification i was first time amazed by the most interesting observation when it came out uh, and when the archaeologists placed it uh, that in several of the bodies available in mehergarh they found elaborate drilling in teeth now i'm not sure whether dentists were available at that period of time but it is for sure that when you get multiple drill marks on the same teeth of one body and when you get in one region eight bodies among which five have got teeth then probably you know that there was someone dedicated it is not just a casual reference that way now in archaeology it is largely conjectural like many other sciences are it is conjectural you have to apply logic you have to guess a few things and there will always be some sort of gaps perhaps that are to be surely bridged by later on other subjects and uh, archaeologists say particularly one archaeologist uh, mido the animals in mehergarh grew similar in body size after a time this is another important observation because when the domestication happens then it is seen that the male body and female body differences size differences they also get reduced they get almost similar by 5300 bc the chalcolithic period had began they started using metal and uh, the progress in material culture continued unabated with innovation upon innovation wheel turned pottery cotton cultivation terracotta figurines 
all leading up to the early Harappan phase of the civilization by 3000 BCE. Now, here is the backdrop of the Harappan civilization that is happening there. When you have excess production, then your production warehouse is in the village. But when that production is in excess of use in the village itself, you look for a place where you want to give it to others. But now when that happens, one particular community is doing well. They have many things to produce and share with others and others do not have. They would like to have it from here. But they will not always come all the way down to this village to get it. You need an exchange place. And that would be somewhere in between. The cities will come up. The city will be a trading place, a marketplace. It will not be exactly production oriented at the very beginning. And Harappa and Mahanjadaro and Lothal and Kalibangan, all these cities came up immediately after that. Not immediately, I would say, they took millennia. But even then, after that, there was a cultural continuity as if the, the, hinterland in village is already prepared so now you can go for further level of the civilization and mind you when this Harappan civilization came up Harappan civilization the current size of India land size of India is probably 3 million square miles and Harappa Mahanjadaro civilization was 1 million square miles so that is one third of it so in that ancient world, it was the largest civilization. It was updated, of course, and it was the largest civilization. <laughs> Definitely. Now, what we find there is even more uh, interesting. So, we need to look at other pieces of evidence to see how Mehrgar could have come into being. But before we do that, let us remember that neither India nor Iran existed then. Now, who are the people? Who developed Mehrgar? How did it happen? Is it possible that the early Indians, the first Indians who came to India, they went back to Northwest and created it there? Or is it possible that people from the West came up there and started a settlement? That is the main issue now to be settled. Towards the East, the earliest evidence for agriculture is from Gujarat and Eastern Rajasthan from around 3700 BC. In southern and eastern India from around 3000 BC. In Malwa, Madhya Pradesh from around 2000 BC. And in Vinda region from around 1700 BC. The only region that could provide such a platform is the middle Ganga region where Lahura Deva in Sant Kabir Nagar district of Uttar Pradesh in the upper Ganga plain, there is indeed evidence for rice harvesting, sedentary settlement. Now the sedentary settlement is more important. When you have good agricultural producers, you tend to settle at that place. Your lifestyle becomes more sedentary. So there was a mark of sedentary settlement there. But still, I told you earlier that this did not grow up into a full-fledged agriculture-based settlement and civilization ultimately. So, who were the people? It is therefore es difficult to escape the conclusion that there were very close connections between Mehrgar Neolithic and West Asian Neolithic cultures. But that should not take away from the fact that Mehrgar had its own strong and striking characteristics quite separate from those in West Asia. Why is it so? Because Mehrgar animals that we see, the Mehrgar uh, plants domesticated what we see, we find out that there, there is a very strong match. And not only that, Mehrgar is a region which was probably desert up to 9700 BC as far as climatological records are concerned. Now all on a sudden from 9700 BC which was an absolutely um, inhabitable place that becomes very much fruitful and production and it is seen that the people who came there they almost suddenly started producing agricultural producers which is normally not seen in those places where agricultural experiments happen. When agricultural experiments happen, it takes a long time to develop it 
to that level but in mehargar once again it is seen that as if people were in hurry they came and they started producing immediately along with that when we get the evidences that they used similar kind of animals they used similar kind of tools they used similar kind of items even though there are differences once again i am saying now this is a big problem in india there are differences i am coming to that and even though there are many thing original in mehargar as well still it is a high possibility that being at the border of the expansion of sumerian civilization as well there were exchanges of knowledge now our problem is that if we say that we learnt it from somebody then immediately you become an outsider then immediately you become an invader and that is the real problem when we learn something lending something from others that doesn't mean that doesn't stop us to do our own inventions which we have done which we have did in many places so that doesn't take away any of our originality but the problem is the purity cannot stop purity doesn't do the claim of purity i'd say doesn't know where to stop and that is why purity will try to grab everything try to try to place a claim everything at on everything and there lies the problem so when we say archaeologically that there is a possibility that the western side had a movement towards uh, this direction then actually we are not taking anything away from these people it is a possibility to a large extent of a migration now these are the first group of people who created harappa and afterwards when from 2600 bc at the peak of harappa up to 1900 bc it continued with one of the most flourishing industrial uh, civilizations of the world they produced they produced a fantastic standardization of weights and measures all over this period in all those cities they had the same metric of weight they had the same metric of length and that uh, percolated to a much later period as well for length measurement they used angulum and we have seen that even in the maurya period the same angulum unit were being used they had definite measurements of stones which are very carefully standardized and nowhere in the world it has ever been seen that the same standardized weights were used in multiple cities in mesopotamia in sumer when they had multiple cities they could not stand as i standardize it but that doesn't mean once again that all the harappan cities had a common administration rather there are indications probably they were not uh, under any common administration but probably a group of elites were leading it from various aspects and those things were going well there now here comes another issue that after this harappan civilization was most probably uh waning down because of a very strong and severe uh, drought and uh, the environmental conditions changed altogether where did these people go did they vanish they did not in fact our genetic studies once again sir will prove probably uh, with much more stronger convictions that these are the people who form the substrate who forms the basis of indian people and uh, i am really in love with tony joseph's metaphor here he says that the indian people is like a pizza the first indians are the base of the pizza somewhere thick somewhere thin but the crust is absolutely necessary if it is not there the indians are not there and over it there is a smearing of the sauce and who is the sauce it is the harappan people who spreads over it and who spreads over the northern region and the southern region and you can have that is why 70 to 90% of our genome shared from them so he gives a very interesting reply that if you ask who are the indians my answer is look at the mirror you are so there is not much of difference at all and when there was another group of migration through which 
the tribal communities formed we normally feel that the tribals are genetically absolutely different and uh, they must be very very uh, different from us probably we consider them even more primitive than uh, the first indians and they are not the genetic studies show that uh, they too have similar common base genomic structure that we had it only changed later on the most remarkable thing comes up when you place the genetic maps over the linguistics maps and i'll just mention a few parts of it uh, even though i know i'm taking a little more time in india we have two language groups in northern area we have the indo aryan language group and in southern area we have this dravidian language groups now the question is even though this language is not obtained uh, I and mean, this language has nothing common to share with any other language outside this language is very these languages are very strongly studied and we find linguistically there are many many similarities between other languages as well if you consider certain words in sanskrit the mother is called mater mater and that becomes in ancient greek mater and in latin mater similarly the vrater becomes frater and that becomes frater from which fraternity has been generated the same way the agni in sanskrit becomes ignis in latin latin the same way the ox in sanskrit becomes axel in english and experts like william johnson and many other linguists they have studied the language features they call them loan words loan words are the words which one particular uh, language speakers use which are very very common to another language and that is a different language but they have been picked up because of their geographical proximity and by the study of the loan words they found out that almost all these languages they are now com commonly called under a, an umbrella term the uh, indo european languages now these indo european languages were very very close and from that they decide that probably even before the dispersion the indo european languages were being spoken in a proto indo european form at a place from where it migrated to the other part of the world and before the migration happened these words were common to that and that is why there is a evolutionary pattern among these words when the language is differentiated these words differentiated to another form but still maintaining their basic nature and depending upon that the migrations were studied once again and it has been established that probably it is the iranian steppe region from where this migrations happen and later on when we further studied genomics we further studies the genetics migration pattern we exactly found that that yes that is possible that is the most acceptable form now there was another migration after this and that is proven by three types of studies and the recent papers that have come up immediately even one paper has been published today itself by dr basant sinde by david reich and certain another 92 other scientists and they have studied one archaeological sample that was available in rakhigari rakhigari is another place which is in india rakhigari is 80 kilometers from delhi and it is a harappan city that was inside delhi itself and in the procedure they have taken is called ancient dna sequencing earlier we could only sequence dna from a living person but now techniques have been developed so much in last 3 to 5 years that is why even from the ancient fossils you can extract dna and that dna can be exactly sequenced and you can find out the matches between the ancient dna and the current dna now when the ancient dna in some cases the ancient dna extraction becomes extremely difficult it is not possible even when the sample is there but 
full structure of the DNA is uh, not possible to obtain. That also happens in cases. In that case, there has been a development of another technology. That technology actually deals with rather old DNA. I mean, DNA of the communities which are not as ancient as we wish to have, but which are very old, maybe 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, we have some samples from which the DNA can be extracted. And when these DNA patterns are matched, it is found out that the migration pattern that linguistics were getting, that archaeology was suspecting, that is matching. And when we place that genetic map over the language map, you find that there are four waves of migrations into India, of which the last one, the third one happened with those who brought probably some agricultural senses and some proto-Indo-European languages. And the fourth one happened definitely with those people who had the usage of horses. Because still now Harappan scripts could never be read. We could not decipher the language. But the Vedas has been very well studied. Now the nationalists, they ask a question that why so that in Vedas there is no description of a very long journey or any migration at all. The point is that they try to take Vedas into a period which is 4000 to 5000 BC, which is an absolutely impossible case. The genetic evidences, archaeological evidences and linguistic evidences show that the earliest of Rig Veda was a post-Harappan phenomenon. And if that has to be a post-Harappan phenomenon, then probably Rig Veda was composed at a time when the migrations were even one millennium before. So, the same way, if you go to the Bible, you will find out that the physical description of Jesus is non-existing at all. Because all the biblical gospels, they were post-dated Jesus' death and at least 300 to 400 years after Jesus' death, those descriptions came. So the physical Jesus is not described at all. It would be hardly half page of physical description for Jesus. The same way, when the migration has long been passed, there is no recollection of the migration altogether. And there are another group of so-called self-proclaimed experts like Sikhant Alagheri, uh, N.S. Rajaram and all, who try to claim that uh, these linguistic differentiations happened inside India itself. And after that, everybody migrated outside. So rather than out of Africa, it was really an out of India exodus. Now, that has been finally contradicted and very well proved by the genomic studies, which show that it can never ever be the case. I'm almost towards the end of it. It's a very, very long and very intricate issue. So probably we could go on and on for hours and hours together. But... I would not like to do so, and Sar is waiting for so long, Sar, I'm sorry that I took a little more time, but I'll finish with just one statement. Our, our footsteps, our footsteps on the sand are transient. It will never remain. The fossils do not fossilize the behavior and character. So probably we will never know whether the Aryans were aggressive or not. Probably we'll never know whether they were as poetic as the Rig Vedics verses say or not. But we know they came with the basic language, though we do not know whether they came with the basic poetry or not. The poetry perhaps is created here. And the creations and creativity is not any time geographically located or rooted at any position at all. So even if you consider that the root are somewhere outside, it doesn't have to be that the intellectual property goes to somebody else. It is never the case. And since it is the situation, I would conclude with what Maya Angelou has said in her collection of essays and stories entitled Wouldn't Take Nothing to My Journey Now. Dr. Partha Pratim Majumdar has also used it in one of his articles and I follow him here, it's beautifully said. It is time for the preachers, the rabbis, the priests and the pundits and the professors to believe in the awesome wonder of diversity so that they can teach those who follow them. 
It is time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. We all should know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry and we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value no matter their color, equal in importance no matter their texture. Thank you very much.